John, you can introduce the program person tonight. Well, I feel pretty lucky to be able to introduce our speaker this evening, Harold Davis. And if you don't know Harold, he's an artist, an internationally known photographer, educator, and a best-selling author of many books. And the one book that I was going to show you guys, which is absolutely fantastic, is the latest book that he's put out through Rocky Nook, and that's uh, a photographing flowers for transparency is one of one of a really nice chapter in here. It's just absolutely fantastic. But if you haven't seen Harold's website, digitalfieldguide.com, you really should. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Harold. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. I'm going to uh, share my screen without too much further ado here, and then I'll talk a little before I do anything else. So. Um, Oh. Okay. So hi, everyone. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Linda, for the great introduction. I appreciate it. And let's be informal. Um, I'm going to go do a hybrid model myself. I've been fully vaccinated. Um, I, I like Zoom in some ways, but I'm tired. I want to get out there. I want to see people. So over the next few months, my crystal ball is still a bit, bit murky, but over the next few months, I'm going to be doing some things. I'm going to be planning some things in person and both personally and more like a, a workshop or two. And uh, I'm looking forward to it very much because it's been an interesting year. Yeah. So <laughs> as an understatement. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, we've, we've been here, Phyllis and I have been here with our four kids uh, all year. The wow. day count is 374 days for a couple of reasons. We've been extremely careful. Uh, if, uh, and, uh, you know, that's meant really we've been just about outside, outside our bubble, not at all. And that's a, what a change for me from my former life where yeah. I was about half the time traveling around the world. Wow. So... I'm gonna go back somewhere in between the two is my, my general plan. Um, photography as poetry. Well, you know, <laughs> we all know that photographs are a means of communication, visual communication. And um, the thing is that really what this presentation is, is what do you think about me? It's all about me, photographer <laughs> as poet. So I got you here on false pretenses. You thought I was <laughs> gonna talk about poetry, but actually I'm talking about me as poet. What actually, more seriously, what I, what I like to say is that you have a form of narration in photography and it can be either a prose, it can be like a short story, or if it's a series, it could be more like a short novella, but what it it what it uh, it can also be more like a poem like soft snow falling in the woods here's the cover of my most recent book creative garden photography which linda was nice enough to show and here's a creative black and white the one the book that came before it the book we're working on right now so there's always a book before a book after and a book to come <laughs> the one we're working on right now is about a composition and there are many books about photographic composition out there in life. This one is taking a slightly different uh, slant on things. I, I sort of looked at something that Edward Weston once said, which is that to study the rules of composition before you go out there and make a photo is a little bit like studying the rules of gravity before you go out there and make a, and take a walk. So uh, my, my takeaway from that is that there really are no rules. But, the, but a photograph is, besides being a narration or a poem, is also a piece of, um, of two-dimensional design within a frame. So there are principles of design that one can use if one starts with fundamental shapes and repetitions and, th and things like that. And so what I'm trying to do in this book is work through some of those concepts in a useful way. And I keep in mind, Ansel Adams had a saying for, <laughs> for every possible photographic situation. <laughs> and this, this is one of my favorites. There's nothing worse than a sharp image of a fuzzy concept. 
<laughs> Take that, pixel peepers. <laughs> so I said I've been traveling a lot over the last 10 years up until 374 days ago. In fact, in 2020, I had an incredible year of travel planned. It was really back to back and pretty exciting. But here are some of the places that I've traveled and li liked most. Gardens are high on my list and as wilderness destinations are as well. And I like to walk pilgrimage trails. So I've been on the Camino de Santiago twice now and the Kamonokoto in Japan. And we'll see some photos of those places as I go along here. Mm -hmm starting with Yosemite. The point of my image of Yosemite and the one that follows is uh, to create a kind of heroic feeling, almost a little bit like a beer stock painting as opposed to a straight photograph. Um, in fact, my intentions with these images are almost all poetic and painterly as much as photographic. I, I, I give people the advice that when you're looking at images, you should look at the images of artists as well as, uh, as, well as photographers. It's very important. So, you know, yeah. here's a beautiful glow in the very early morning in a snowy February in Yosemite. I also should say, by the way, that I've got two segments of this presentation. And I do hope to have some discussion or questions as well. But after the presentation itself, I have a, a little movie to show you. Cool. So get out the popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> the trees and the last one and this one are both dancing. So the point of the image really is how do you see a tree as a a living thing, sure, it moves a lot more slowly than we do mm. and gradually over time. But if you look at them, they're relating, they're dancing, they're living things just as we are. Mm. This is a, um, a islet in uh, San Francisco Bay. It's not very far from where all of us are. And it's a night photograph. So the reason there's this wonderful glowing light quality to it is because I photographed it at about midnight on a full moon night under the clouds. You can tell that it's night by taking a look at the, uh, uh, at, at the trawler with the running lights on back to the right of the island. I, I like to create, just, just as some poems are puzzles, I like to create images that are to some extent visual puzzles. At first glance, this is Chinese mountains. At a closer look, it's a beach. You can see the human footprints tracking through it. So that gives you a sense of scale and the surf coming up on the lower left of the image. Wow. Here's a gigantic uh, hillside de in Death Valley where the light of the cliffs meets the shadow in a sort of see um, uh, saw kind of pattern. The thing here is that each of these cliffs is maybe uh, 500 feet. So you're looking at a really vast sense of scale here. So, yeah, well, I, I used to be at home abroad. I don't, I don't know what it's gonna feel like venturing out now. It's gonna be a little different. One of the places I've truly enjoyed photographing a great deal is in Monet's garden at Giverny, which is shown here in a spring photo. This is when you when you visit the gardens, what you find is that they are divided into uh, two parts. Originally, it was a railroad track that separated them, the commuting train into Paris, and it's long since been separated by a sort of subway. Sub a uh, semi-submerged roadway. There's an underground staircase that goes between the two of them. So this is the upper part, which is pretty much a conventional uh, flower garden. And the lower part is where he built his famous um, lily pads and stuff and was, he dammed up the local river to make it that way and was in sort of constant feuds with his farmer neighbors who thought he was out of his mind. The patterns of the rooftops of Paris. Mm. 
This is the uh, Lago di Como at uh, in not too far from Milan, Italy, in the first light of dawn. And so, I was staying with a friend on the on, on in his in his um, second home on the uh, on the lake. And uh, I said, "Well, I'm going to get up and go down there for dawn." And of course, to be there before dawn, as we all know, you have to get up in the pitch black. So I did and I bundled myself up. You know, I, I always prefer to travel in the uh, off seasons and go places when not in high summertime. So this was November or something. Mm -hmm. I walked down there in the dark. He said, Harold, have fun. And uh, I did. <laughs> this is Tuscany, San Jim Gimignano. And yeah. uh, Another picture of the French countryside. The Gem El Fana in Morocco, in Marrakesh, had about a four second exposure. So enough so that you can see some motion in some of the figures, but the ones who weren't moving too much are pretty crisp. Hmm. One uh, question that I tend to get is, and this is, this is, another, this is another sort of answer to the, photography as poetry or photographer as poet, what kind of photographer are you? So, you know, the people, it, this came up so often in Japan, I can't tell you. People would say, what kind of photographer are you? And they wanted something, you know, very explicit. I'm a, I'm a wedding photographer. Well, you know, there have been times in my years as a professional photographer that I've made my living in various ways. Uh, uh, <laughs> Well, we'll go there in a bit, perhaps. But what I've been lucky enough to figure out how to do, really, is to make a nice living as a photographer taking the kinds of photographs that I want. So what I say to people is that I am a photographer as poet. I'm not a commercial photographer, whatever that means. I don't uh, trade my photographs intentionally for, it's not about money for me. Um, you know, Henri Cartier-Bresson said that to sell all rights to one of his photos would be like giving up the skin on his eyeballs. I, <laughs> I quote that to people who are trying to be outrageous about whatever licenses they want. And as you can see, I have fun with all this. A lot of the work that I guess I'm known for has to do with photography on a light box or a backlit kind of photo. Uh, interestingly, this Nautilus shell, which, you know, it's, a, it's easy enough to photograph a Nautilus half like this, uh, was, but this one's been widely reproduced, printed, so on and so forth. And it's photographed on a light box and inverted using Photoshop's LAB color space to create the black background, which creates the, the glow effect in it. And this is a, a peonies on a light box. I call it peonies mon amour. And uh, it's a simulated printed here on a piece of uh, unrayu wa uh, washi, washi paper which it prints beautifully on, a very decorative print. And, but if you look down on the lower right there, you'll see a hand stamp, it's an Incan, and it says, photographer as poet. So you see, I have not only a self-assigned title, but I also have my own, uh, my own stamp that Stop. says it. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and fun. So don't forget fun. Fun is such an important part. Why are we doing photography? Uh, it's to have fun in part and to explore the world. My camera is a, a way that I have an excuse and an appendage for exploring everything and to have fun. So no knowledge is wasted. Dubious principle, but it's actually pretty true. Uh, I, I've been a photographer with a studio in New York City that was roughly 1978 to 1988. Uh, I've been trained as a fine art painter, both uh, abstract and uh, figurative. Uh, I have a fair amount of background. Dave, as a... can you turn that off? <laughs> Sorry. What's that? 
I think there's a mute request if people could mute themselves unless they want to ask questions. I think that'd be appreciated. All right, shall I continue? Is everyone set? Yeah. So yes, I've also been a computer programmer. And as uh, Linda so nicely pointed out, I've written many books. And I've got academic degrees in computer science, math, and a law degree. <laughs> Uh, I used to think that was wasted, but at this point, I'm not so sure. I do also like to photograph commonplace things like these mixing bowls from our pantry with another Nautilus slice in it. Now, spirals are great. They are very symbolic. Here we have the back stairs at the Embarcadero Center in downtown San Francisco, blending via post-production into a Nautilus shell. And over the years where I've been traveling and leading workshops, of course, I found myself often in uh, restaurants. And um, I, too, don't consider myself really a wine connoisseur, but I do like a nice glass of wine. Here you see uh, the eye of Sauron in his cups, as far as I'm concerned. Flowers. This one I call Kiss from a Rose. So this, is, this image is... Uh, many things, but one of the most interesting is that it is fairly constantly mistaken for a Georgia O'Keeffe painting. Mm. Um, so O'Keeffe did uh, a wonderful painter, one of my true uh, art, art heroes, um, and I, someone I look to for inspiration. She did not, in fact, paint roses. If you look up Red Rose Georgia O'Keeffe on the internet or the various places on the internet where they have photo photography and art, you're a lot of the time, this image of mine will come up occasionally with attribution, but mostly without. This is a nice Camellia Japonica, which um, is uh, one, of my, one of my favorite flowers are uh, Camellias. So it's a wonderful softness. It's very symmetric and a white rose. So sometimes you can play with depth of field like this red tulip in, at uh, Giverny. So the point here of this image really is the difference between the crisp rose in the foreground and the more poetically out of focus ones in the background. So what did I mean by photographer as poet? It's my passion. It's an avocation. Yes, I, I, you know, I, I like it when someone uh, licenses an image and pays me well, that's nice, or buys a print or whatever they do, but I'm not a hired gun. And it is about the fragile joy, beauty, tragedy of our lives and world. And I like to make my part and leave the world at least slightly a better place. So I want to trod gently with things called this image, The Road Less Traveled, which is certainly one that I've been on. This is a panoramic view from the view of 10,000 peaks along the Kamonokoto on the Key Peninsula of Japan. It's raining like crazy and I had somewhere along my walk there, I picked up an umbrella, sort of a, uh, these are kind of mountains with roots and rough trails going up and almost ghosts. You can palpably feel the millennia of people who've walked, walked along these uh, pilgrimage trails sacred to Shigundo Zen. And up at the top at this pass, I can't swear there were 10,000 peaks, but I, I looked out, I held the umbrella, I had the camera on the tripod, and this is mm. a stitched together horizontal uh, panorama about, about 18 different shots into this. So very, very high resolution original. Sometimes I just like to fool around in Photoshop. So I consider post-production very much part of, part of my art. I'm, you know, on the one hand, if you can do it in the camera for all, for goodness sake, do it in the camera because that saves a lot of trouble. On the other hand, I don't care how somebody get, gets something, you know, a pixel doesn't know where it comes from. <laughs> So it's fine with me if people work in Photoshop or whatever they like to do. Photoshop is part of what I do. And here's a somewhat 
more complex version of the same, more fractally eschery version of these twisting stairs. Called this one down the rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. For perhaps obvious reasons. And sometimes when I start out doing one of these things, I just don't know what I'm gonna end up with. <laughs> to, to me, this looked like a um, night photograph, maybe of car, uh, car lights, trails and stuff. It's actually a macro of sunlight coming through a bottle with colored liquid in it. And here's another, uh, another refraction of light through a bottle. But this one I think says that uh, the people who say that there are aliens with ray guns out there are probably right. You can see this alien in the reflection here. And this is, uh, th uh, this used a, what's called a probe lens. And so I have this cool probe lens that's waterproof among other things. And it's about 14 inches long. It's a wide angle macro. And what you can do with it is you can put it inside a, something like a crystal bottle. What you should also do with it, I mean, it would be the lens to photograph a, a, a deadly snake with or something for sure. And this is looking into a parfait glass with the same lens. Hmm. And the, uh, the blue cup. So here's a spiral. This one is a um, blue hydrangea uh, blossoms that are really small things, if you've seen them, and uh, pebbles. Okay, words are very important to me. Uh, it's not just that I write books for writing books, but my words and my blog, I've been writing a photography blog since 2005. That's an insane amount of time, about uh, 15 years steadily 10, 15 stories a month. Some of them are just like, well, I have a workshop coming up stories, but a lot of them are substantive essays about various things uh, in addition to my books. As one of the people who collects my work said, what you really are, Harold, is a digital artist who uses photographs as your source material. And teaching and writing help support my photography and I'm using support in a broad sense there Certainly, yes, it's part of how I make my living, but also uh, it, I, learn, I learn from teaching and I learn from writing. So photography helps support my art. I mean, it's interesting. I view myself as an artist first and photographer second. And that's, I think, an important distinction. I have, you know, I have to include some other uh, quotes about me. Why not? If you want to be a photographer as poet too, you can. <laughs> my, <laughs> you have my permission for sure. In fact, I encourage it. I think it's a great idea. It's a great goal. Find interesting things to photograph and you don't have to travel to do that, which is a good thing this past year, let me tell you. Um, and, you know, want to, want to become a better photographer, stand in front of more interesting things. Want to become a really better photographer, become a more interesting person. So that falls into tap into your deepest self. Photography is a quest and a spiritual destination. That's how I feel about it. Except the adventure. You know, I go someplace to photograph or I photographed this morning, I was photographing Papa or Poppies in my, on my light box. But it doesn't always come out the way you pre-visualize. Take it where you're going to take it and master the craft craft here being photography, post-production, and also understanding the artistic context of what you're doing. Where does this fall in the history of uh, 20th century photography? Where does it fall in the broader history of art dating out of the Renaissance? These are two mandalas. This is the original one shot on a white background with screened paper added to it. This is inverted using the L channel in LAB color in Photoshop. Huh. This one's kind of interesting. And um, it's 
a combination of a light box image and an x-ray image of these roses and ranunculi. So it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun, uh, a fun image. Intersections and concepts. Yeah, so photography and painting. I use, uh, I use digital painting in my work quite a bit. Um, the digital era, and we've been seeing this with NFTs and God knows what, is, is a very technology-based era and doesn't really respect handcrafted work. At the same time, you can use the wonderful <laughs> tools that we have, digital cameras, wonderful printers, to make handcrafted and artisanal things. And, you know, there's modernism, there's Eastern style of art and Western style. It's very neat to be able to blend all kinds of different things in one's work. Hmm. I call this one uh, the gates after Rodin, uh, but it's one model and it's one in-camera multiple exposure blended in uh, 10 different positions, each one a, a separate strobe exposure. Hmm. And here's the same model on a kind of hoop that they call a liar. And what I asked her to do was to navigate her way around it. And again, each one of these is a separate a component of an in-camera multiple exposure. Hmm. And, you know, with Leonardo's drawing of Vitruvian man, I felt truly, why not have a Vitruvian woman? Mm -hmm. This is uh, uh, from the interior of Son Dong ca Cave in Vietnam. It's the world's largest cave. Fewer people have been there than have been to outer space. It's not an easy place to get to by any stretch of the imagination. You better be okay with uh, dealing with leeches, uh, venomous snakes and various other interesting jungle things to get there. But it's quite a spectacular place from the inside. Thanks to the miracle of uh, digital photography, I'm, I was able to make a, a basically a high dynamic range capture like this because there's a huge variation from the leftern wall of the cave, which is basically pitch black to the entrance of this cave. I called this light box panorama into the vortex of the universe. And here's a, here's a uh, autumnal mandala, again, on the light box with a succulent in the center of it, a pale garden. So here's, um, here's my bio in it with the 10 cent version. It's a, more than 10 cents here, surely. My dad, my dad, God bless, God bless my parents. They are in their 90s. They are doing well. They have isolated in place this year. In September, God willing, they'll be celebrating their 70th wedding anniversary. My dad's a mathematician. My mom's an artist. My earliest ambition was to be a writer, painter, photographer. I have an asterisk there because the reality is that my earliest ambition was to be a trash collector <laughs> because <laughs> at that time we lived near the near in stores Connecticut and when the trash truck came once a week to the house where we lived it was a very big deal and made a very loud noise and I thought it was very exciting but once I graduated from that I, I wanted to be a writer <laughs> painter and photographer <laughs> yes uh, so I yes I studied I've studied painting um have, have uh, computer science math degrees and uh, a JD from Rutgers Law School. I had a photography studio in New York, many exhibits, assignments. I crossed the Brooks Range solo and I also started a publishing company. Here's a uh, photograph from the Brooks Range in the 1980s. And another photograph from Alaska, film photograph from those days. This is one of the posters that I published when I, was, when, when I was in the, when I was doing that. And I had an assignment that involved hanging out of a helicopter over the World Trade Towers. Here's one of the, for a real estate company, here's one of the images. And another in, in camera, mind you, multiple exposure in the film era. I can't believe I did that. 
good grief. And here I was enjoying the disco era. So I combined digital painting with photography. I like light box work. I've experimented when I can get access to the machinery and to the technicians with x-ray photography and LAB color. I think the black and white work I do and the uh, floral work is what I'm most known for. I do like to make prints myself and with my wife and partner, Phyllis. And um, yes, I lead workshops. Here's a in-camera multiple exposure. And another one. A lot of what I was trying to do with this series here was to emulate the look of Hindu gods. Here's a, a more complicated image. And this one becomes a combination of a light box work and post-production where you see the same image replicated in different guises. So you look here at something that's a bit surreal like a Magritte painting with that was actually my, my what I was emulating here with the railroad track going through the page out the other side. Where's it going? What's the perspective? And here's a x-ray again of the inside, both the inside and outside of some tulips. Here's a, 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 re, a repetitive version of becoming a photographer as poet. Respect your path. Everyone is different. Know yourself. Share yourself. Listen for the poetry. Embrace life. These all sound like, you know, they're easy to do, but they're not necessarily not in a world that is filled with responsibilities and all kinds of things that are distractions, perhaps. A camera is an extension of ourselves, an appendage to bring us closer to the universe. This is uh, beginning to be a very long exposure with the waves softening. Uh, I took this one out on Point Reyes on the on uh, the Great South Beach, and it's about a 15 minute exposure minutes. The same thing here. I love doing this kind of thing. And I love looking for the light in images. Underneath the Berkeley Pier. Mid Coast, California, Cayucas Pier. And uh, I showed this image, a color version of it at the beginning. It's the Aquina Bay Bridge near Newport, uh, Maine, Maine uh, Oregon, I'm sorry. So as I started out saying, and when you want to look at photographs, if it's a poem, it can be quiet and soft, like snow falling on a country lane, bold and brassy like Reveille in the morning. Look for the ineffable. Things you can't put into words, you can't explain, you can't talk about. If you can say it in a few words, then why bother with the photo? Outward simplicity and inner complexity. And the important thing is always the heart. Without heart, what do we have? We have to care for each other and the world around us. A simple image with the window and the um, shadow of the sun coming in and not much or ornamentation in the room. But at the same time, this is a, well, this is an image really about sheltering in place. It's an image about ice, kind of isolation. And here with this close up of a gazania flower, you look at it and it's almost architectural in size. Tulips on a light box. And nice so soft flowers from some of my work this year. So it's been a creative year for me working with flowers mostly from my garden. And continuing to do. Here's a nice clematis. And uh, these, this is perhaps the last image I made before, before we shut down. It was out in Death Valley and Escalante and that part of the beautiful part of the world. Looking back at the Sierras. 
Ooh, thank yeah. you. And here, here I am. Um, so this is about five hours of star trail exposures at night and in, in Furnace Creek and Death Valley. And what I like to do is I like to sleep somewhere near the camera. So there I am in my tent, the lights on, I'm reading. And then when I turn the light off, it takes the rest of the photo. And here's Lady Boot Arch in the Alabama Hills. And again, and here's a discount code for my black and white book from Rocky Nook, H. Davis 40, and a discount code for the garden photography book, Garden 40 from Rocky Nook. Here's all about how to get hold of me. And I think the next slide is gonna say questions, but why don't I, why don't I go ahead and play the movie bef uh, because it's only about two minutes. And then, and then we'll have a Q and A session if everyone would like. Sounds yeah. good. Okay. So let me let me stop let me stop share for a second. Get it loaded and load it back up with sound. It's, it's going to take a measure of. Okay. Okay. I gotta do that. Let's see. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay. So uh, if there are questions, I'm happy to do my best to try to answer them. Are you going to do any workshops on the light box photography? Undoubtedly. I mean, and let me say also, in the meantime, there are a whole bunch of them up on my YouTube channel. Oh, great. And so that has the advantage that they're free and we don't put advertisements on them because <laughs> I hate YouTube ads and uh, you can get started right now. But yeah, we're undoubtedly going to do in person once again, too. It's my crystal ball is a little murky as to how, when, where and why. But, you know, prior to prior to the pandemic, we did a light box workshop every year here in Berkeley well attended uh, people all over the world for it. And I'd like to, I'd like to do it that again, if I can, but we'll see, you know, I don't, I want to wait till it's completely safe and people are comfortable with that kind of thing too, because to do it right, you have to work, you know, in a room with people for over a long period of time. So mm -hmm. it's not something any of us are quite used to right now. You really have to know Photoshop pretty well to do 
uh, the light box, how you do that though, for transparency. You mm -hmm. think Linda? Yeah. I don't mm -hmm. know, you know, it seems to me that really the skills you need to do that in Photoshop are to add a layer and to make a mask. Those are about it. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not putting those down, but I, mm -hmm. I don't think anybody, first of all, I think every photographer should know some Photoshop. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, but that's me and I realize not everyone agrees with that. But second of all, I think that, uh, you know, it's like anything else, you know, there's more in Photoshop than any one person, myself included, could ever learn in a whole lifetime, but, uh, or even several lifetimes. But, you know, it's not that hard to put together those exposures. The real point of, of doing the multiple exposures like that is that you can take advantage of some that are high key and lighter and some others that are darker. For example, if you put a rose on a light box, for the most part, light isn't gonna go through it. So it's a darker thing. But if you put something like a tulip petal on the light box, it's gonna be brighter and shiny. You can't get a single exposure that will do justice to that. So that's the reason for doing the bracketed exposures. Yeah. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Um, yeah, um, I'm working right now on color theory. And one of the things I really appreciating about your work is how you use color. Um, I'm trying to understand it and then understand how to apply it. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, who, who was talking, please? Conway, over here in yeah. Ireland. Hi, in Ireland. Uh, it's a great question. <laughs> As, you know, certainly some of what goes into my work is some of the colored color theory I learned in, in my painting classes. Uh, yeah. I'd recommend a, col a color wheel if you're not already using one. Um, hold yeah, on a second. I'll sh uh, you you know what you know what they are, Terry. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I'd recommend There's getting. There's a good one online. Hmm. Well. Yeah, I'd recommend actually getting a physical one. Hold on a second, let, let me show you mine. Okay. This thing is really my friend. <laughs> right. And this one is, I mean, I'm not saying it's the best one there is, it's, uh, it's the brand name on it says Atomus, A-T-O-M-U-S. And uh, it's, 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 it's great. Um, besides that, of course, you know, you, got, you need to look at the painters who were masters of using uh, color relationships. Um, the impressionists come to mind, Cezanne, uh, you know, they knew what they were doing with color. When you start a work, do you start with a color palette in mind or? Sometimes. post process. Sometimes I start with a color palette in mind. Uh, for example, today I was definitely doing reds and oranges. Um, but some of that is, um, what's the word? Uh, what's the word? It's some of that is uh, what, you know, it's, it's I take advanced situational. You know, too. I mean, if there, there's a difference between being a photographer and being a <laughs> painter with a collection of pigments. You know, I'm not always free to choose what I want. I, in the, but, but yeah, sometimes I do. And sometimes I try to limit my color palette because limitation is a great enhancement of creativity. I did a series of, uh, of, of abstracts from bottles where what I was trying to do was create a sort of Rothko dark blue look. There, there's another painter to look at, by the way, for color relationships is Rothko, who was a total master. You might uh, also take a look at the colorists at Frank Stella and uh, Ken Noland, who, who really knew what the heck they were doing with that. Also Paul Clay and, uh, well, that's enough of a list, but. <laughs> Thank you. X-ray um, photography. You mentioned X-ray photography. Is that a, um, 
Is that being done through Photoshop? Or have you got some special equipment for that? And my joke there is that the access to the equipment to do x-rays is the most expensive camera I've ever used. M <laughs> most of the x-rays you'll find on my website were done on a mammography machine. Huh. Okay. You, it's not, it's not uh, typical for somebody to have access to that. So those were through my uh, friend, the radiologist, Dr. Julian Kafka. I've also done a couple of uh, x-rays through uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs. They have a really high powered uh, beam line, it's called, which, which does x-rays of really fairly uh, microscopic things. But obviously, you need either a technician or somebody who knows what they're doing. And this is not, uh, not equipment that you really can have in your basement, particularly. <laughs> Harold? Yeah. This is when you uh, design your mandalas, mandalas, do you pre-plan, you have it all thought out in your mind, or do you just, you have the flowers that you want and just sort of fly by the seat of your pants? You know, sometimes it, it depends, but mm -hmm. closer to the second. <laughs> you know, uh, it's more fun to do the second, really. I mean, but what's important, first of all, flowers don't last long on a light box. So, you, you know, that you don't have that much time to do them. It's important to have everything laid out. And I think thinking about color considerations right off the bat is very important. So usually I have some kind of plan, but unfortunately, as we know about plans, my plans can be a little half-assed. So uh, I, I don't, I'm not scared to deviate from whatever I thought my plan was. The, uh, and, and I put that more nobly than the half-assed thing. I say, well, you know, as photographers, what we have are given is some kind of quest, okay? Let, we're, we're gonna go photograph uh, sand dunes in Death Valley or whatever it is, or flowers on a, on a light box. But you know something is going to come up on your way to Death Valley. You find uh, you find this beautiful looking pinnacle in Trona Pinnacles, and that turns out to be the best photographs of the whole trip. So don't say no to side trips. Accept the quest you're given, but but be open to adventures that come along the way. Thanks, Harold. This is Nancy Goodenough, and I consider myself a photographer uh, of the uh, unexpected. And I, your early pictures in your presentation with the glowy uh, painterly landscapes is uh, so, was so drawn to, and so it would be so unexpected for me to do that. But I want it. I want that glow. I want that feeling. It, what can you talk about it or which book do you have that talks about it because I'm entranced. <laughs> well, thank you, Nancy. And <laughs> hi, it's nice to see you too. Um, first of all, a lot of that was being at the right place and the right time. And, you know, in all honesty, whatever photographers may say, a certain but real portion of the craft and art of photography is being at the right place at the right time. Uh, you know, there's another Ansel Adams quote for that one. He said, sometimes, uh, sometimes I happen to be at the right place just at the moment that God wants me to press the shutter. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of true for those Yosemite images. Um, in one, in, I, I had a project that had me photographing uh, Yosemite over a fairly long period of time. It ended up as a, as a book. And so that was great. And I was up there, you know, in heavy snows in, in the winter. And also with my oldest son, he's now 23, but he wasn't when I made the images. And so we were, you know, we were staying at Yosemite Lodge, you know, and it was cold and it was dark. And he, he was probably eight years old and he starts nudging me at about 4.30 a.m. And he says, Dad, You've got to go out there. It's going to be a good day today. <laughs> yeah, no, he insisted. So out we went and uh, bundled up completely. It was cold, all right, and it was dark. And then the sun started coming up, and a lot of what you saw was just the way it was, at least in some of the images. Uh, the a couple of them. 
have a lot of post-production involved too. And that, that's a different issue. Um, that, that, that's the, what I was referring to was what you did, uh, whatever you want to speak of in terms of that, because I'm able to take things because I am not a pre-dawn person. <laughs> um, and I'm able to sometimes create things that, you know, would not be expected uh, for it. And I wondered if there were any hints of uh, things that you do or some direction. Well, uh, let, let, let me throw out some general stuff. I don't think any of the books I have explicitly direct address this. Uh, one, one thing is blending modes are crucial for this kind of post-production. Oh, yeah. Okay, number one. And you taught me that your first book of uh, the digital darkroom, was it? Creative right. darkroom? The Photoshop darkroom. Photoshop yeah. darkroom, I have both of them. That's right. where I started. I learned to do layers with the pictures that Phyllis did. So I, you- It's yeah. a good way to learn layers. Anybody who's puzzling over that might want to take a look at the Photoshop darkroom books, particularly the first one. Mm -hmm. um, so layers, number one. Number two, um, most filter effects are god awful at 100%. They're pretty nice, a lot of them, at between 20 and 30%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I call that the homeopathy principle. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> a, little, a little bit of the poison will, will, will save you. Number three, always go both directions. If you're going to make something softer, also make it harder. And that's that's really the meat of the images you're looking at. I mean, I would add, I would add, let's say the the Nick Glamour Glow filter at not at full strength to parts of it, and then to other parts of it, I would add the Nick Tonal Contrast filter. But never one alone. Always in combination, and always at far less than full strength. Always using a layer so for each, so you can modulate it. Modulation is a great concept. I'm sorry, I can't be more specific but th that's those are i uh, consider it a dance as well and uh you've got kind of a yin yang thing and i do I, I, it, it speaks to how i play and uh, it 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 inspired me thank you harold thank you go ahead sorry yes go ahead can i ask a question so if you, is there one thing that you could choose to tell an aspiring flower photographer to do, what would it be? I, I have this terrible feeling I'm gonna say something not very helpful, but love flowers and learn about them. Ronnie's already on her way. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure she is. I mean, I've I've seen I've seen your work around, and I've seen you know it's not. I mean, that's. Um, I mean, it's a complicated craft. You know, to become a good botanical photographer requires mastery of all kinds of things, and one of the things that really is most overlooked is the botany. And that's been a real gift to me. I never thought I'd be learning this stuff. <laughs> and, and yet it's been really important to me. Can you be more specific about that? Well, no. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean it's, it's like, okay, so what, what is this part of the flower? Why is it important? Ah, okay. You know, and how do they reproduce? And how do you grow them in your garden? A lot of the flowers I photograph on my light box are things that I grow. You know, I, I simply could not buy them. It's not possible. You know, they don't last long enough for one thing. And you don't have um, exotic species of pop poppers very much, unless you're in Afghanistan, I guess, the, <laughs> which would be interesting. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. Beyond that, I'd say study painting. Look at some of the great botanical artists. Um, I have. I, I'm a, I was an art history major. <laughs> I'd recommend on that score, you may know this, but there's a great painter who may not have been such a wonderful human being named Emil Nolde. 
N-O-L-D-E, a German, and he did wonderful watercolors of flowers that I've really found inspirational and uh, used as basis for some of my images. Thank you. Thank you. That was very helpful. Your landscapes, Harold. Um, are a lot of them long exposures? You bet. You bet. And almost all of them are tripod based too. But yeah, I mean, long exposures do something for you. And, you know, if, I mean, there's no, no, what's the word? It's no, there's no, there's no merit about making life difficult for oneself. It's just, it's just the tools work better for me when I take my time and put it on a tripod and say, okay. Yeah, a lot of them are long exposures. The only problem there is really motion. You know, if you have yep. tree, you know. Tree leaves moving in the wind. Yeah. So you make your money and pay your, take your chances or whatever that is. But the thing is, it's important to understand the photographic tools you have. You know, what does shutter speed do? What does depth of field do? What are the lenses that you're using do? What are your options? And then you, then you try to combine that with what your idea of what this image is gonna be and correlate the two as best you can. As we open up, what's your plan for travel? Well, I don't have much of a plan yet. My crystal ball is, except that I'm going to. Damn, damn, damned if I'm not. Uh, my my crystal ball is murky. I'm still needed at home. You know, I'm I'm really our emissary here. The rest of my family is gradually getting vaccinated. It's going to be a while before they all are, mm -hmm. and so somebody somebody who feels safe walking into a supermarket is needed. But I will be traveling, and uh, I will be I will be leading groups. I have a trip to the southwest of France that was scheduled for April 2020. It's looking like it'll be April 22 before it actually happens. I have a, another hike on the Camino de Santiago that is that is waiting for me, all paid for and everything else. And uh, I would like to exercise it. I've been told that traveling in rural Europe right now is not a very good idea, even if one's vaccinated by people who know because um, the hospitals are overwhelmed. Even if you feel safe, you know, that's, not a, that's not a good place to be particularly for them or for you. So I'm beginning to suspect that my travel in 2021 will be domestic in nature, but that's a murky crystal ball and I don't know any more than anybody else does really. I, I really want to do things safely though. That's, you know, I'm, I'm really, when I, when I do workshops and groups, um, I'm going to say, okay, please be vaccinated. I mean, you know, it's like, why, why risk people? And, and I also should say, I do, I am booked at the uh, uh, Chicago Botanic Garden at the end of August, and I expect to be there. That was going to be my Very next good. question. <laughs> I expect to be there. It's the link, the link to the workshops on my website. Do you still do wave? Do you have a date yet for your composition book coming out? Well, what, one question at a time. <laughs> Thanks. Waves. Uh, do I still do waves? Yeah, I love waves. <laughs> Will you do any more workshops about waves? Like likely. Oh, good. Likely. Uh, the book is supposed to be a end of this year book. But at the moment, a lot of it's up here, so we'll see. We're, we've got a good start on it, but it's a, it's a tough topic in many ways. Yeah. Well, people. Oh, was Joyce Bell wanted a question? You're muted. She's muted. You're muted, I'm, Georgia. I'm sorry. I, there was so much noise here. I'm a terrible guest. I apologize. <laughs> no worries. No Welcome worries. To SRPS. I, Ashley, I do have a question. What what um, lens do you recommend for the um, uh, light pad photography? You know, great question, Joyce. Uh, oddly, it doesn't matter that much. 
This is, you know, if people are ho always hoping that I'm going to say you need some special fancy extra hoodie duty macro lens for it or something, but you don't. It's mostly not macro photography. I use a prime normal lens for it. I use a 55 millimeter prime lens. Okay. So I don't know what brand you, you photograph. It's what is it? Nikon uh, Canon? Sony, but I have an old so, Canon, which would work just as well. So, uh, the, so, the Sony's fine. I mean, I mean, any, any lens, it's really an issue of geometry. Okay. okay the I just wondered if a, a, you know, a faster lens was better. No, not particularly because you're on a tripod anyhow. So the shutter speed doesn't matter. The one problem people run into is zoom creep. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. that's so, that, so that's the one thing to be careful about. So yeah, I discovered. I thought I could lock my Sony lens in place. Well, you can't. Yeah, you know, I've heard of uh, gaffer tape used for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's an idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. What do you like to do for black and white? You have any comments there? I, you had some nice black and whites and really lovely. Thank you. Well, I do have uh, two books on the topic. Not, <laughs> not only uh, Creative Black and White from Rocky Nook, but also the Photographer's Black and White Handbook from Monticelli Press, which is a really oversized halfway to being a coffee table book as well as a technique book. Um, so you know, I started out as a film photographer, of course, and doing four by five and, and other black and whites in the dark room. And then I learned to make my own color prints in the wet dark room. So, you know, printmaking is an important aspect of black and white for me. Most of the black and whites you've seen have become prints in some way or other. And I, I really feel you don't really see them until you print them. If you're asking me what software I use, um, the, I, I'll make a couple of comments there. One, it, one is that the beauty of working through Photoshop layers is that you have pinpoint control of what process you want to do on every different uh, square millimeter of your image. This is a little bit like what the uh, what Ansel Adams and his followers said with his own system. So generally my black and white conversions are stacks of um, different conversions. I do like the filters in Nick Silver FX a lot. On One has a nice black and white conversion program. There's nothing shabby about black and white adjustments in uh, Photoshop or Lightroom for that matter. Uh, the Channel Mixer is a good black and white tool. Lots of good tools out there. All, the only thing that you really need is a vision of where you want to go with it. And keep in mind also that the absence of color means that the, the composition becomes incredibly important. You know, if I you, love, yeah, yeah you know. It. The road less traveled is gorgeous. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I really like your black and white, your different ones, and the way you handle the tones and, you know, your converging, you know, lines and things like that, you know, just really, you know, I'm thinking to myself, gee, I wish I could do that, <laughs> you know, or something better, and or maybe I've got something I could do with, and I'm not sure how to go about it, you know. <laughs> well, 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 please, please, uh, please give it a whirl, start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and keep in mind, as I said, that if you do it via Photoshop layers, you have real control about how you convert each uh, part of it. And then also, you know, if you're start getting started with black and white, you have to say, okay, how do I pre-visualize this as a black and white image? It's not going to be about the color. I mean, the eye first goes to color. That's the right color. That's the first thing you'll go to. The second thing you'll go to is sharp areas. But if you don't have the color, that's a crutch. You, all you're going to really see when you look at something is what's the shape of the composition? What are the underlying shapes? So to do that well, you have to become good at analyzing or what they like to call pre-visualizing what it's going to look like once it's a final black and white image. One possible uh, um, tool for helping to do that is to turn, turn on the thing in your camera that does a black and white preview. 
on that because oh. that can give you an advanced look at what it's going to look like. I yeah, don't I'll... recommend using the in-camera black and white conversion as your final conversion because usually that's not a very high quality monochromatic conversion. But, but in terms of when you're out there and is this going to be a good black and white composition, it's a great way to help pre-visualize it. Thank you. I'll have to try the layers because I've done a lot in Lightroom and you know, and then you know the darkroom classes in college and we did film and stuff. But you know, I'm always want to get it to that next level. I think. Oh, well, good luck. Harold, Thank you. Don't you have a black and white webinar coming up this week? It is true. I've got one Saturday morning. It's uh, on black and white, the black and white still life, and it's sort of the in a sequence I've been doing, and this is the last one, but it, it should be a good webinar and a fair amount exactly of what we've been talking about. That what I like to do in these webinars is to actually show me processing an image because that seems to be what, it, what, unfortunately to do that, I have to do reduced sizes because you can't just cannot over Zoom do it in real time. But it, it I think gives people a better idea of what the possibilities are than anything else. And thank you for bringing that up. You're welcome. Phil Phyllis just kicked me. Yeah, exactly. Pat, did you have something to say? I thought Pat was going to ask something. Sorry. I have a question about light boxes. I've never used one before. What uh, characteristics of a light box or any particular brand of light box uh, do you recommend for your type of photography? So there's a very thorough FAQ on my website about this. And it includes, among other things, a do-it-yourself plan for building one along with a bill of materials with, with materials out of uh, uh, Home Depot or Lowy's or a place like that with cost of materials under $100. And it's pretty easy to put together. Uh, typically, but honestly, I mostly store-bought mine. Um, it's another made in China thing for the most part, but you'll you'll find you'll find links there. Honestly, it doesn't matter too much what kind you work with. I mean, I, I did a workshop oh, a number of years ago out on Point Reyes at the Coast Guard Boathouse on macro photography, and some and one of the projects there, some of the students used a old glass window with a piece of white paper taped under it and a, and a standard household light bulb as the light source and they actually got some great images out of it. So the real concept here is basically just it's good, it's good diffuse backlighting. And it, here's the thing, if you uh, took a flower and put it up against a white background, a white wall, a white seamless, whatever, and just photographed it at the settings your camera recommends, what would happen would be that the um, the white would go gray, would that because that's what happens when you do that. If you so, the whole point of this light box is a way around that, or that's one of the whole points. It's also to to show translucency because translucency is so beautiful and it looks so different. Uh, that there are there are things that you can put on a light box that actually look better not on a light box. Uh, turns out that most feathers aren't good subjects for a light box because the beautiful colors and feathers come from iridescence, not from not from translucence. And iridescence is reflected. But you know, anyhow, I think that kind of answered your question. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your generosity, of information, and sharing. Oh, and uh, I, lo I, I love to share information and, you know, I don't really feel there are secrets in this. So, so uh, that's um, a good thing. Harold, um, I, your um, discount codes, mm. only um, good through Rocky Nook. Um, we shouldn't be going through Amazon. That's right. Those discount <laughs> <laughs> those, those, those discount codes are only good through Rocky Nook. And I personally have been trying as much as possible to steer people to the source and away from Amazon for a variety of reasons. I have to admit that in our household of six, 
more Amazon packages show up here than I'm entirely pleased about. But so I don't want to be too hypocritical about it. I mean, but I, I think both I and the publisher really do appreciate it when people go direct. And that's part of why they're able to offer that kind of discount. And I, I also want to point out that they really have a good uh, ebook, real book bundle. It's very little more to get both. And that's, I think, worth doing because if you actually bought the ebook separately, say on Amazon or something, it would be expensive. And, and I've got H. Davis 40 for which book? That would be for the black and white book. And Garden 40 for the gar newest garden book. Correct. And I'll send that out to the group. Great. Yeah. Thanks so right. much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Thank you. It's, it's Thank you. Wonderful knowledge with us. We're just yeah. Hey, healthy, everybody. Thank Stay you. safe. Yes, I, thank I you. Think hey, you Harold. Too. Good to see you. Likewise. Bye, Bye everyone. Us. I will do that. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.